All right, ladies and gentlemen, today's newest episode of Heal Thyself. Thank you for joining the show, rating, reviewing, subscribing, telling everyone that you love about the show because it means a lot. Did you know that we've hit over 500,000 downloads? It's the new year and we are going to explode over a million this year easily. Thank you all for supporting the show. You have created such a powerful movement, such a powerful bonfire. And from the deepest part of my heart, deepest part of my soul, I thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, today's show, boy, it's a good one. How many of us don't have allergies? How many of us haven't even experienced allergies? Most people I know have. So we need to get into what they are, what they're all about, how we palliate them, how we handle them, and what is the root cause, of course. Then after that, I have an amazing, amazing, amazing guest, really good friend of mine, naturopathic doctor up in uh, Portland, and she's going to drop some really, really awesome knowledge about how we can care for our body. So without further ado, let us get into this beautiful knowledge bomb. Allergies. Man, I mean, I used to suffer from allergies and I'm talking about really bad. At some point in my life, it was like a spray of perfume would give me asthma. Actually, sometimes even still. Um, I have a very sensitive system and many other people do. Matter of fact, 50 million other Americans do because they suffer with allergies. As per the College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, allergies are the six leading cause of chronic illness. This is things that people are suffering with all the time. Maybe they're perennially, maybe they're seasonally, but either way, it's a problem. Really the most common manifestation when you think about allergies, you see it in the cartoons, you see it in movies, is you get allergic rhinitis. That's just the medical term for runny nose. And that's the most common manifestation, but also you're gonna see itchy, watery eyes, but that's really common. Uh, itchy eyes, itchy, itchy body, sinus pressure usually coming with along with that, headaches, wheezing, some chest tightness. How about shortness of breath? How about rashes? How about some swelling? That's, that's really encompassing what it is when you look at the picture of someone with allergies, but some lesser known things are things like heartburn or some changes in your bowels can actually be due to allergies, right? And I'll talk a little bit about your di digestive system. So some of these allergies can be a problem big time. It can lead to something called anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis, we've heard about it. That's when let's say someone allergic to peanuts eats a peanut, uh, eats a peanut or peanuts and their throat closes and they die. Uh, they can't breathe, their respiratory tract closes, and it's a problem. Um, so that is the most severe manifestation of this immune-mediated reaction that we have to these antigens or these allergens, right? So usually these, these anaphylactic um, issues come from foods, insect bites, medications. Um, but most of us really one time or another have had some sort of allergic reaction to something. Um, when we talk about seasonal allergies, so usually summer, spring, early fall, that's when the times where we're seeing folks have these symptoms coming up right to the surface, right? So when it's seasonal, um, you have to think about where it's coming from. Most of the time it's trees, grasses, weeds, pollen, those along those lines, right? Um, the things that, you know, like, let's say in the spring, uh, when I was little, I used to get the same allergies. My eyes used to water and itch so much in the spring. And um, what was I taking? Maybe Claritin or something like that. And it helped. But there's so many other options now. And that's what I'm here to tell you. Now, if it's perennial, right, throughout the year, we got to think about what's going on in the home, right? Dust. Dust is a major problem. I definitely have an allergy to dust. I still do. That's why I keep my house very dust free. Dust can carry a lot of crap. It's got chemicals, it's got germ, it's got mold spores, right? Then you think about pet dander, cockroaches, me medications, insects, latex, mold in general, right? These are things that are in the home that are always, always, always going to elicit um, some aller allergic symptoms to those who are sensitive. So allergies are more prevalent in males than females. And um, when it comes to allergies, it's not just things like hay fever, right? Hay fever were things that I was talking about, like when it's seasonal allergies, but you have to think about food allergies too. Now, I won't go too much into food allergies because I will do a show on food allergies and food intolerances so you have a better understanding, but there is such thing as food allergies, right? Our immune system can react to food. We also see things like dermatitis that manifests as allergies in the skin, right? Constant itching and rashes. How about asthma? that's connected to allergies, sometimes with food, sometimes with things on the outside of the home, things on the inside of the home, anaphylaxis I mentioned. It's all in the same bubble of what's happening in the immune system, right? So what's, what's happening is you have this allergen, right? And it's got this 
substance or structure on it called an antigen. You may have heard that word before, or you may remember it from school. And that's what elicits the immune response. Now, by the immune response, I mean our antibodies, right? We have these things called immunoglobulins, right? And it's particularly the one called IgE. So if you ever hear the word IgE mediated, you know that that's allergic, allergic, allergies, allergy symptoms, right? And that's involved heavily in the process. So what happens is it binds the allergen, and then it's binding to a mast cell. And that mast cell, this is the problem. The mast cell, once it's bound to, it releases all of these particles, right? It's like it's like unlocking a little bubble, and then that bubble opens up a little pore, and then just shoots out all these little particles. They're called histamine. That's why we have antihistamines, because this histamine, that's the chemical that is causing in our body allergic symptoms, watery eyes, itchy eyes, uh, itchy skin, uh, wheezing. All those changes are due to histamine. So the beautiful part about medicine is they've created antihistamines, but the beautiful part about natural medicine is that there's natural antihistamines that are a lot safer for folks too. But then we have things like uh, steroids that really calm down the immune system as a whole, period. Um, and then we have things like adrenaline, right? Like EpiPens, that's when someone's having an anaphylactic reaction. You're giving that adrenaline to open up that respiratory uh, airway so these folks can breathe again. But when you think about allergies, we have to think about, is there a genetic component? Yes, it is strongly tied to the family, but we have to ask how much of it is pure genetics versus a predisposition. Is it genetics based on something in the home environment that the parents were exposed to before having the child, and now that is dictating the predisposition when the child is born, such that when, when the kids are born, they're born into a world that has created a compensatory mechanism in the body to protect it from the very allergen that the parents were experiencing. So we have to think about something deeper. Is it epigenetic or is it pure genetics that's being passed on? So as a big picture, really the question is, is what's being passed down from the parent uh, a gene that is being expressed that is giving allergies or it's, is it a compensation mechanism that is happening in the parents? So we always have to think about those things, right? We can't just take things at face value because then we would just be, you know, sheep. So how about a child? How about how the child is raised? Well, that's really important when it comes to allergies. There's something called the hygiene hypothesis. You may have heard of it. Our immune system has balance, particularly in the Th1, Th2 system. These are the T helper cells. There's three types of T helper cells. Th1 and Th2 are the major ones that are in a seesaw mechanism type of relationship, right? So T helper one, T helper two cells. In this hypothesis, there's a dominant system, right? Usually the Th2 system becomes over dominant based on environmental influences that are pushing it, right? So Th1 is something for more fighting intra cellular pathogens like viruses or cancer cells, whereas Th2, well, that's going to be something like an upregulation of our antibodies. Remember I talked about IgE, an upregulation of antibodies in our system, right? So the more things that are outside of the cell, like bacteria, allergens, mycotoxins, parasites, toxins, these are when that system is going to be upregulated. So the belief is this, when a child's immune system is immature and developing, we are pushing that balance of the seesaw more towards Th2 by creating a sanitary environment, right? By a sterile environment, we are pushing that system because our child's immune system is not maturing correctly throughout the exposures that it needs. Now, what do I mean by exposures that it needs? Well, we find that children in larger families ha are experiencing less allergies. Uh, growing up in a rural uh, country, less allergies. Around livestock, less allergies, less antibiotic use, less allergies. You see the big picture? What I'm trying to say is there has to be influences outside of the child that start pushing and influencing the growth of the immune system and the maturity of the immune system. Exposures are important. On the other side, it's important to protect your child, but please, if your child's rolling around in the mud, let the child roll around in the mud. And we're starting to see an increase of immunological disorders the cleaner a country and the more industrialized a country gets, right? Which is crazy for, to, to hear, right? Because we, we wanna think that as we become more advanced as a civilization, so too does our medicine, but this ain't true. It ain't true all the time, right? So we see links in an increased amount of antibiotics also, and childhood asthma and allergies. We also wanna be, care, be very careful about antibacterial cleaning agents, right? Sterile homes, they make me cringe. Please clean your home, keep it clean, dust it, but let your child be exposed to 
of things. The immune system needs it, right? If your baby's rolling around, let your baby roll around. If your child's in the mud, let your child be in the mud. Baby's immune system needs exposure, all right? So uh, we have an obsession with keeping things clean, but make sure that you're understanding that there's a balance, right? You don't want that TH2 system to be overwhelming and imbalanced so it's so heavy that TH1 isn't even active. Remember, and you don't believe me, go, go in and start doing research, right? It's really important for you to be a firsthand uh, participant in the health of your child and yourself. So another thing, when you're getting allergies, right? What can we do? Pay close attention when you're getting allergies. Get a book. Write down the time. Write down the things that are making it better, things that are making it worse. What food you ate that day, the day before? How about your stress? How about your sleep? How about exercise that day? You want to see things as a whole, right? As a holistic self, you. Write it down and start tracking your allergies to see what's making it better or worse. Is it better when you're home or is it better when you're outside of the house, right? And how about your digestive system? How is it that day? It's so important because... Allergies are deeply connected to gut permeability or what we call popularly leaky gut. Okay, allergy shots can help in the large majority of people, but it ain't getting to the root cause. Just like claritin, it ain't getting to the root cause. These are antihistamines, steroids, immunotherapies. Um, they will help as to thank God for EpiPens. They will save lives, but we have to get to the root cause so we don't put ourselves to that place, right? So nature's antihistamines, I'll name a few. This is not my recommendation. Ask your doctor. I love quercetin. For me, it works very well. Nettles, medicinal mushrooms, uh, essential fatty acids, vitamin C, boswellia. These are very important antihistamines that come from nature, which is beautiful, right? Antihistamines and mast cell stabilizers. They'll tell those mast cells, hey man, Calm down. Don't release all that histamine in the body. Just take it easy today, all right? Ask your doctor, all right? I, this is no recommendations. I got to cover my butt over here, all right? Food intolerance is very important. If you're having inflammatory foods or you're eating foods that are activating your immune system, that's a problem, right? Because it's going to elicit gut permeability, right? Leaky gut. And that's going to be causing a lot of immune dysfunction because what's happening is there's particles and proteins that are not supposed to be in your blood coming from your digestive system that your immune system is going, what the heck is this? I ain't never seen this in my life. Now I have to react to this. So we want to relax the immune system, not keep it overstimulated, oversensitized to things, right? And that's what really happens when you have gut permeability. And this is where the power of plants come in. You want to eat phytonutrients. You want to temper that inflammation. You want to eat gut healing foods. And I will do a whole show about gut healing foods and gut health in general, but really, really important. And to go back to those plant foods, think about, think about there's inflammation and ash and grime and dirt. And it's like a fairy godmother, right? It's waving its wand and it's creating a beautiful green field with flowers and luscious diversity. That's why we got to, man, every other show I tell you about whole food, plant-based diet, whole foods, food plant-centric, eating all these foods, the fiber, it's so important for everything, right? We're, we're talking about allergies now. We can talk about gut health later. We can talk about cancer later. So, 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 so important, right? So make sure your food choices are, are really aligned with good gut health. If you have food intolerances, understand what's stressing your system. What foods are making you feel crappy? Know the most allergenic foods like corn, soy, shellfish, et cetera, right? Know those inside out and see, are they stressing your immune system or, uh, or, or putting in foods that really are going to be helping it, right? You want to know what foods are going to have your immune system reacting and rebelling against you because you don't want your immune system rebelling against you. You don't want that allergy to turn to an autoimmune disease one day, right? So if your gut ain't right, your immune system ain't working tight, period, right? Your immune system is loose, it's out of order, and you're going to suffer for it. Think about your environment. Audit your home, right? If there's toxins in your home and you're breathing these in, that is filling up your allergy cup, right? That's going to mimic allergies. Your immune system is going to hate it, right? So what you want to do is reduce that burden, reduce that load. That's your responsibility, right? And I talk about it so much on these shows because it's so important and it's something that's never addressed by allergists, primary care physicians, a lot of naturopathic doctors. So I'm here to submit to you that you need to look outside of your body too when it comes to your health. Balance the TH1 and TH2 system. Remember I said that. That balance is so important. So there's actually foods out there and supplements out there that can help reestablish that balance. You might want to work with a naturopathic doctor, functional medical doctor in this capacity because they'll be really good at being able to help and understand what's going on. Balancing your system, getting that TH1, TH2 right, right? Fixing your gut if there is gut issues, which is going to be really important. You ain't going to recover from allergies or even get better or temper those allergies if your digestive system is a mess. And of course, auditing your home, as I mentioned, those are the pillars to start 
right? The pillars to reduce those allergies. Allergies are not forever. But I know that. I had the worst allergies. I almost have no allergies. I've reversed allergies in people. Allergies are pretty easy from the get-go. You just have to understand what's going on. So don't walk around with no hope. You got hope. Your allergies can be healed. And uh, that's, that's uh, listen, I'm not guaranteeing from my side, but really, that give you take a lot of hope. Find some naturopathic doctor. Find some functional medical doctor. Allergies can be a bitch, I promise you. I hate them. I suffered with them. But you know what? I healed from them. And you can too. All right, check it out. Special guest I have been waiting. She is right there staring at me. So let's get her in here and do this fire show. All right, everyone. Today's special guest is a friend of mine. She just came into LA, T minus about like an hour ago. So <laughs> I'm so happy that we got her on the show. Uh, Dr. Tina Moore is a naturopathic doctor. She's also a chiropractor and she's a regenerative specialist. So all you in pain need to be listening to this plus all of the beautiful details. We're going straight into it. Thank you, Dr. Tina Moore, for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We, we were planning this for a while, so I'm glad I could, we could make it work. Yeah, we made it work. Yeah. And uh, literally, no, I wasn't lying. You just got to Yeah, I flew in LA. for this. From where? <laughs> Portland, Oregon. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I love Portland. Yes. Um, especially in the summer. Yes, that's where we met. Mm-hmm, and that's where we met. And one thing I found is when I went there a few months ago when it was a little bit colder, like let's say, I think I went in April, I couldn't believe how fresh the air was. Yeah. Do you, you notice the difference between here and the air over uh, there? When I was flying into here, I could see the brown uh, yeah. caking over the Ew. city. And I thought, <laughs> the, my first thought was, I can't breathe in LA. Like, no. I can't breathe in LA. No, and we had the fires a few weeks ago. Yeah. And, you know, you'll see on the different apps that the air quality is really crappy. And you can feel it. You could feel it. You're out there and it's like someone barbecuing next door. Yeah. No, it's literally like your ashes are falling. It's it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it's Gr scary. I never grew up here. I didn't see this type of stuff. I grew up here. I grew up down here actually in Southern California and then I moved to Portland. We usually get wildfires every summer up there. And so we're usually blanketed in smoke for several weeks and we didn't have it happen this year. So yeah. knock on wood, you guys got it, unfortunately. Yeah, but it's fresh over there. Like your skin feels good. You know what it feels like? It's like there's a cool mist always hitting you. <laughs> So that's everyone's it's glowing. Raining all the time. I know, maybe because that's what it's always <laughs> raining. So, uh, so out in your practice, I know, I know, we're going to get into what you do, but do you see a lot of people who have some seasonal affective disorders too, like a underlying yeah. part of it? Yeah, I would say mood issues are prominent. I deal with pain. I think that drives pain to mm -hmm. some degree. Um, I think inactivity because of all the rain is yeah. a big one, and we have a lot of mold. I was thinking about that when we have I was a lot up of mold. there. So there's a lot of mold, and there's a lot of mold-based illnesses, and I think some of my favorite herbs and meds are based around treating mold, so. Yeah, and, and that can also drive pain, right? Yeah. The sensitivity to pain, neurological changes. So um, you, you mentioned sort of what you do. Uh, I know what you do, and I love what you do, <laughs> but let's introduce the listeners and viewers about what your um, practice is like. Sure, so I do regenerative medicine. Uh, what that basically means in a nutshell, I've been doing this a long time, long before stem cells came on mm -hmm. the scene as the popular hot thing. I do a form of um, natural orthopedic-based pain solution. So mm -hmm. it's injection-based, so there's needles involved, which people don't always love. And I do a variety of different techniques. I teach it to other doctors, specifically naturopathic doctors is my passion. Um, everything from prolotherapy, which we can talk about, to mm -hmm. platelet-rich plasma, to different types of growth factors, all the way up to stem cells. Okay. So and it's mainly orthopedic-based. There's some aesthetics in there, but I love joints. I'm a chiropractor, so I love musculoskeletal medicine. Right. And, and when I listened to your talk at our yearly conference, yeah. I was really impressed because not only were you so passionate about the science of everything that goes on with pain. What is pain? Where does it originate? How to inject? But then talking about the art of it. And that's really what you're big on is the art of properly doing this, these techniques, because um, you can't just go and find any doctor who's doing it. They have to be doing it right, correct? Right. And that's hard. A lot of doctors just shoot juice in the joint. So you get an MRI, the standard of care is you go to the doctor, you have pain, they give you an anti-inflammatory. Anti-inflammatory drugs actually destroy your joints, slowly but surely. Um, when that doesn't work, they put you, they might give you a painkiller, which so we have the opioid crisis happening. Mm -hmm. 
When that doesn't work, they'll give you a cortisone injection, which is actually catabolic. It chews up your tissues. Mm -hmm. This is like standard of care in medicine in the US and most places. So then your joints disintegrate even further. And then maybe if you're lucky, you get into some physical therapy. By then, you've done some damage. Um, I actually think most underlying joint issues are metabolic in nature. That's why I love being a naturopathic doctor and right. really sorting that out because I think it's diabetes of the joint in mm -hmm. many ways. And then maybe you are or are not a surgical candidate. And we know in the orthopedic world that surgery begets more surgery. Mm -hmm. So on and on that goes. And people sort of go in circles. I actually interrupt that whole process. I inject sugar water. That's my favorite thing to do. It's called mm -hmm. prolotherapy. And it's an injection technique as well as what's in the syringe. And it's sugar water, which is crazy. But it's regenerative. And it quells neurogenic inflammation. So it calms down pissed off joints, if you will. A lot of people's joints are actually thickened and angry because of underlying hormonal, metabolic, gut, infectious diseases, you know, mm -hmm. you know, stealth infections like mold, things like that. And their joints are just angry. So you can quiet them down quite a bit and get people way dialed down on the pain spectrum. When that doesn't work, we have bigger guns. We just, it's the same technique. We just put bigger, fancier things in the syringe. Mm -hmm. A lot of doctors now are jumping on this regenerative medicine bandwagon and they're just shooting juice in the joint. So ultrasound probe on the shoulder expensive yeah. solution in the joint, okay, you're good to go. But what about all of the ligaments and tendons and muscles that surround that joint? What about finding the pain generator? What about doing it elegantly? If you don't know your anatomy, you can't palpate well. And if you can't palpate well, you can't really find the pain generator. Mm -hmm. So a lot of doctors are missing the boat. Yeah. They're trying and they don't know what they don't know. But I feel like I have a superpower as a chiropractor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I, I know what I'm doing with my hands, and then the needle just follows suit. The best of the both worlds, right? Yeah, I, I like to think. So, so, <laughs> so you mentioned a few things. So, if you make the intervention of maybe doing an injectable or just just seeing someone, you're saying that in a perfect world you can prevent the anti-inflammatories, the cortisone yes. shots, correct? Yes, that's the goal. My goal with treating patients always is function before. Everybody's, every p patient's main concern is pain. Obviously, they're coming in for pain. I care about function. I care about range of motion. I care about stability. I care to arrest the process. I'd like to slow it down and dial mm -hmm. it back. Once, and anybody who's out there who's over the age of 45 knows this, once you, well, and even younger, once you start in a pathological state of a joint, it's sort of just snowballs. Yeah. Once you hurt your shoulder or your hip or your knee, then the whole nightmare starts and you end up with a bunch of inflammatory cytokines and the whole, you know, snowball. So I can arrest that. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. um, pain relief comes later for a lot of people. Sometimes it's immediate and people love me, but other times they're really frustrated. And I'm like, hold on, we're getting there. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to undo some damage, especially if they've been, if they've had the interventions like cortisone yeah. and the rest, or they've yeah. been on NSAIDs for a long time. Like it's a lot of joint damage. Yeah, and they expect immediate relief, yeah. right? And saying, what do you mean? This is supposed to take away all the pain, right. correct? Right. But that's not necessarily the truth. They're sort of rebuilding the tissue, as We're, you said. Yeah, so I, I tell patients, if you cut your fingertip off, how long would that take to regenerate? Mm -hmm. Months, right? And mm -hmm. then not only months for the tissue to regrow, but it would take time for the nerve innervation. It would take time for blood flow. It would take mm -hmm. time for all those things. We're trying to do that with joints. So it's slow and steady wins the race. It takes some time. Most people who are rational understand that. I think it's my job as a physician to set that up right and to mm -hmm. set boundaries and expectations up front and let them know, like, no, this isn't a one-shot wonder. It's all over my paperwork. Mm -hmm. This is not a one-shot yeah. wonder. <laughs> Just hang on. Yeah. Anyone who's clouding it as that, I think, is, is uh, you know, misleading people. But... Yeah, it takes some time. And then I think on top of that, the patient has to take responsibility. It comes with a whole lifestyle change often for people. Mm -hmm. I love treating, my, my avatar is like people like me, like people in their 40s who are super active, who love to throw weights around, who just need to fix up a shoulder or a hip. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of chronic pain patients who I don't necessarily get into treating, I usually refer them out. Um, that's a whole different ball game. You know, mm -hmm. a healthy dude who, like, the guy we just met who's mm -hmm. hurt his back, weightlifting, yeah. very different story than, like, 50-year-old, morbidly obese, Mountain Dew drinking, inactive person whose joints are melting. It's going to be hard. Very different. I can't help those people. Like, yeah. there's no amount of fancy injections. It might turn it down a little bit, but I don't think it justifies the cost. That's a lifestyle thing. Like, mm -hmm. that person needs to completely overhaul their yeah. life and get strong, whereas, like, that dude just needs a few injections. 
and he'd probably be great. Mm-hmm. So, and, and and the fascinating thing is, you called it diabetes uh, of the joints. Yeah. So, what what did you mean by that for people who don't know what that means? I think that it's a metabolic process. I think once that metabolic syndrome sets in to a person and their blood sugars start to become dysregulated, it manifests all over the body. And we look at it, you know, you and I as naturopathic physicians, we're taught to look for retinal changes and Mm -hmm. kidney changes Mm -hmm. and different organ systems, but the joints are an organ system and nobody talks about the joints being an organ system. They're considered like this biomechanical entity. So if someone's knee hurts, everybody goes like this to the knee. Nobody looks at the rest of the person. Now, if someone walks in and both knees hurt, or both hips hurt, or both wrists hurt, that is a red flag that some systemic entity is driving it. It's probably coming from the gut. There's probably some kind of um, enteric pathogen or gut-derived pathogen going Mm -hmm. on, and it's usually coupled with hormonal dysregulation. The immune system is now involved, so now we've got an immune-regulated issue, Mm -hmm. and people say, well, I, I got tested for rheumatoid arthritis. I got tested for an immune issue. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the immune system is revved up and it's Mm -hmm. going. And there is often an autoimmune component that gets flared. And I suppose that all depends on someone's genetic propensity. Um, There's always the gut is involved. And then there's chronic deconditioning. People aren't strong anymore. People's joints are melting off their body. I liken it to a crock pot. Did I say this in the Yes, and that's what I was getting getting at. Tell me (laughs) about the crock pot, please. So this came out with my dad. My dad, like, my dad pretty much lives in his lazy boy. And I was trying to explain to him, I'm like, okay, dad, the more weight you gain, we know that fat cells secrete cytokines, mm-hmm. inflammatory molecules, right? So your fat is a little depot of inflammation. So the, especially that abdominal fat, especially that visceral fat. So the more fat that somebody accumulates, they're walking around sort of in a toxic suit, if you will, of inflammation. What happens when you put a gristly chuck roast in a slow cooker? Mm. You turn it on slow and low and you cook it for a long time and eventually all that tissue breaks down the collagen breaks down and everything melts and now you have delicious soft eat well you don't eat this but no but i but, but my roommate does so I, we have a crock pot and i've walked past it so i know i know what you're saying the purpose is to melt the collagen sure and people are doing that they're yeah. inactive they go from their bed to their couch to their car to their desk back to their car back to their couch uh-huh. back to their bed mm-hmm. That's like most human beings, and so in our country especially. So people don't work out on the land anymore. They're not super active, and that's rough, you know? And then maybe they might go to the gym once in a while to exercise, whereas I'm a big believer in training. We can talk about that if you want. It's not about exercise. It's not about, like, running on the treadmill every day. Um, It's about training for a goal, which is longevity. But they sort of crockpot themselves. Mm -hmm. They basically, you know, slow cook themselves with chronic inflammation until they're tissues start melting off their joints and then they want some kind of ten thousand dollar miracle stem cell treatment yeah which doesn't exist yeah so does that manifest as chronic pain arthritis what what does that look like both and interestingly where your ligaments and tendons insert into your bones is called the anthesis and it's not a distinct this tissue turns into this tissue it's like a it it, it's a it's it turns into it slowly so the cell types just slowly change Mm -hmm. and right there is highly innervated so anywhere ligament or tendon attached to bone is highly highly innervated so people go in with chronic knee issues and they get a cortisone injection at the orthopedist office and the pain generator has not been addressed maybe the cartilage is breaking down because the joint has become unstable because of this slow cooking process (laughs) and this deconditioning but all those ligaments and tendons if i were to palpate them they hurt really badly Mm -hmm. and so that's the anthesis point that's where we have to inject yeah i remember you showed i think it was a microscope uh, Mm -hmm. electron microscope Mm -hmm. maybe photo that and we saw that and i was like whoa that's really Amazing. Yeah. But then, but they are just the art, right? Like feeling, palpating, understanding where it is, and then hitting that. Is that where the pain generator is? Where yeah. in that highly innervated area? Yeah. If okay. I can palpate it, I can inject it, and I probably can get it to go away. If I can't find it with my fingers, um, it's probably coming from somewhere else. It's I see. probably some kind of systemic. So, like chronic hypothyroidism, for instance, causes your melt, your joints to melt. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever talks about that. No. Actually, hypothyroidism causes. I have a whole talk about this. Hypothyroidism causes a ton of musculoskeletal pain. Mo- somewhere around, like I think, seventy-five to eighty percent of people who have hypothyroidism have some kind of chronic musculoskeletal pain. Mm-hmm. But nobody ever puts two and two together, mm-hmm. except my little Cairo ND brain always has been. Mm-hmm. I, I people joke like Tina thinks everyone 
has hypothyroidism. I'm like, if they're over 40, they probably do. Yeah, a lot of people do. <laughs> and then thinking about like all the environmental stuff that's really hitting the thyroid too. Yeah. And then the crappy food. It's it's uh, that's its own soup. And then the cooking. autoimmune yeah. component of it. Yeah. It's a mess, right? And so and then low testosterone as people age, your joints will start to melt. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's so many reasons why. And I, when I say melt, I don't mean like overnight melting, but they, there's this slow degradation of the joint and the soft tissues. And then somebody goes to like reach for a basket or, you know, on the top shelf or they like move off a curb weird, the hip or the shoulder does something and now the whole thing goes Yeah, and on and so forth. Yeah. That's, and, that's amazing to hear. Um, w throughout this show, I've actually was blessed enough to get a lot of people in movement and exercise, exercise posture, just all different types of people who are really uh, solidifying the importance of what you're saying, training, movement, joints, mus muscle tone, yeah. uh, uh, visceral fat. This is a theme that's been coming actually more than a lot of the themes that we're putting out there. Oh, that's awesome. Which is really good to hear for not only me, but everyone else. I mean, after I had enough people tell me, I got when I got a trainer. And, I saw and, that. And he's beating me up. <laughs> I and he's saw beating it. me up, but I'm I feeling like, strong. Yeah, he's yeah. training. A hundred percent. Because I said, you know what? I, it's something that is should be priority number one. Um, and it's it's it, the power of exercise in general is is amazing as a as a preventative for different types of cancer and whatnot. Yep. But when you say training, you're saying for like longevity for a goal, right? Like I want to be healthy as I get older. Is that what you're getting at? I have three main goals when I train. I want to put I want to amass as much muscle as I can. Okay. Like safely for my frame because muscle is medicine. Muscle has its own. I don't know. I have an article called Muscle is Medicine, and uh, it's, I mean, I go into it. I, it's also in my book. I have a whole chapter on it. What's the name of your book? Pain Free and Strong. Okay. It's free okay. on my website. If anyone wants to check it out, there's one whole chapter on muscle, and it's well-referenced with all the scientific literature. Muscle itself acts as a, its own organ system. Um, it secretes, get this, so interleukin-6 is a cytokine that we know to be pro-inflammatory mm -hmm. and damaging mm -hmm. and all the issues. When muscle secretes interleukin-6, it's a myokine, and it's anti-inflammatory. Mm. So muscle is literally a depot of anti-inflammation. Um, it does a host of other things. It mitigates our immune system. Mm -hmm. It's it's a wonderful, wonderful organ system. Hormones, it, right? It's the only way to make more mitochondria. We yeah. can say we can try to like regenerate the mitochondria we have, and I know that's a hot topic right now. It's funny. You'll laugh. When I was in college, I wrote a paper about mitochondria because I wigged out because they're bacteria, and I was like, oh mm. my god, this is amazing. Um, anyway, the only way to put more mitochondria. To build more mitochondria is to build muscle. Mm. It's the only organ system we can actually grow, yeah, right? That's With amazing. intention. My other goal is to really keep my central nervous system in check. And that is critical. Um, what I mean by that is it's controlled movement. So I'm not just haphazardly out there swinging kettlebells around. Like I follow a program and a system with a really high level coach and it's about whomping. It's to me, it's about hormesis. I, mm -hmm. You probably talk about that on mm -hmm. this show, which is hormesis is like, you know, strategic stress is the mm -hmm. way I look at it. It's small increments of stress that helps the body. It, it slams the body into going and then you rest and you feed the body and or the organism mm -hmm. and it will regenerate. And so it's kind of like a plant. If you ignore a plant long enough and then you water it, it'll poof, right? Yeah. You've probably done that. Yeah. You come home from a trip and your plant's wilted and you water it. That's hormesis, right? So small incremental strategic stress is is great and that's what strength training does mm -hmm. um i'm really interested in mitigating my immune system and there's a myriad of reasons why exercise and muscle do that and then my hormones like i just want to have i'm 45 like mm -hmm. i want all the testosterone yeah. <laughs> i want yeah. all the hormones so that all i don't balance. age yeah. abruptly you yeah. know and i have found that my thyroid antibodies stay pretty much minim minimized like almost non uh noticeable on lab work and my hormones stay much more balanced if I'm training regularly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's amazing. Those are three key points right there. I, I'm so fascinated with the whole muscle, um, part though, what you mentioned, uh, do you know Dr. Gabrielle Lyon? Yeah. So yeah. she's going to be on the show. Oh, we're, awesome. we're, I'm going to the East coast and we're doing a few shows. Good. So she's, she's, she's coming the, on. She's the expert. Yeah. So I'm excited to have her talk about all that, but I, I am fascinated by that which is why I got a trainer. I'm putting on some more, you yeah, know, uh, that's good. because I see the value in that a lot more now. Um, so when, when these folks are, are implementing a training regimen, um, building up muscle, 
they're reversing this whole process, what you're saying, of the joints melting out, right? Right. Or I think so. I mean, that, that's the goal. If your muscles, your ligaments are stabilizers and your muscles are movers, and most people don't have enough muscle on their body to really keep their joints intact and so their ligaments go on to hyper stretch and ligaments much like rubber bands if they're on slack for too long or on stretch for too long i'm sorry they will eventually sort of stay there mm. they'll they'll mm -hmm. it's called hysteresis they'll eventually stay stretched out and so and then they pull on the ends of bones and that hurts really bad mm -hmm. um, we have to build muscle to protect that joint what happens is the muscles aren't there the ligaments stretch out and now the ligaments are no longer being used as stabilizers the muscles are so any of us with chronic muscle tension, you know, we get it massaged out, we get yeah. acupuncture, we get whatever, rolfing, grasped in, all the techniques. If that muscle continues to clamp down, it's because the underlying joint structures adjacent to it are unstable. I see what you mean. So that's where prolotherapy comes in. So unfortunately, people are walking around ha having their muscles acting as stabilizers. Mm. And when... Doing the ligaments job. Yep. Okay. And when we do manual therapies to them to relax the muscles, that's all fine and good. But if you walk outside after your massage and it, you know, a few hours later, everything's tight again. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, those therapies are just decompensating a compensation pattern. Hmm. And those muscles are actually clamping down because they're trying to hold the body together. That's amazing because I've always wondered why when I get a massage, I leave maybe at the end of the day, I'm back to being tight in different parts of my body, Yeah. which makes more sense. Um, it, that's really great. That's interesting stuff. But okay. So you mentioned prolotherapy. It's sugar. Sugar. And water? Yeah. Why would <laughs> why would someone put sugar in their water and body? <laughs> so dextrose is interesting. One theory is that we're causing a hyperosmotic effect. So we're using con different concentrations of dextrose that we can dial up or down. And at higher concentrations, you're creating an osmotic effect, meaning you're putting something noxious into the body and, and it's at a high concentration. So the body responds by rushing in and it also creates some inflammation. The body responds by rushing in and creating sort of a secondary inflammatory healing mm -hmm. response. It's like a modulated healing response. Ligaments and tendons have really poor blood supply. So we've all probably sprained an ankle yeah. and you're a tall dude. You probably played basketball and yeah. came down on your ankle. I bed. sure did yeah. <laughs> many times. So that ankle sprain doesn't like to heal very quickly. Right. And on the second or third one, that ankle starts to get kind of floppy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because those structures have poor blood supply. And so we go in there, I go in there, the needle itself counts. So actually peppering the ligament and tendon with the needle to creating little micro trauma so that it bleeds mm -hmm. is one way. That's one mechanism mm -hmm. that it works. Secondly, I'm injecting the hyperosmotic solution in there. And then thirdly, dextrose quells neurogenic inflammation. So nerves, the simplest way to explain it is nerves have nerves and those nerves get angry mm -hmm. and we can actually calm everything down and have a really awesome pain relieving effect on top of it. So mm -hmm. not only do we get regeneration, we get tightening of that slack. So things stabilize more and then we get awesome pain relief. Mm -hmm. So it's great. Mm -hmm. And I can dial up or down that dextrose to meet whatever need I have in front of me on, on that patient on that day. If that's not strong enough, I have more potent things I can put in my syringe. Okay. That's amazing. So <laughs> that's sort of like a little hormetic effect in itself. Exactly. In the area, right? That's exactly what it is. Sort of working with nature rather than going against it with anti-inflammatories or painkillers. or So what does a cortisone shot do then? Cortisone is catabolic. So testosterone, for instance, is anabolic, meaning it helps you generate mm -hmm. tissues. Cortisone is catabolic. So I think of cats. Mm -hmm. It chews up tissues. And so chronic stress will lead to catabolism of your soft tissues, which sucks. So people who are chronically cranking out cortisol and stressed out all the time, those will those hormones will turn into intermediates and they will slowly but surely lead to some ligamentous laxity. Um, vegetarians and vegans who don't eat well, who don't mm, do good. I know a lot of those. They are super loosey goosey. Like yeah. I can literally put them on the chiropractic table and twist them all day and I can't get them to lock out because really? there's no integrity in their tissues. Um, that's when they're just sort of like doing it mamsy pamsy mm -hmm. or maybe it's not right for them. You know, I mean, sure. everybody ha needs to, to dial in their individual mm -hmm. diet plan. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. So there's lots of reasons for ligamentous laxity and then cortisone itself. The injection that they give you is super high concentration of this catabolic hormone, which they give it to you because it quells the inflammation temporarily. So you've got an angry knee, they shoot cortisone in, your knee goes, ah, oh, this mm. feels much better. That's because they shut down your immune system temporarily. Mm -hmm. And when that thing turns back on, it's angry. Yeah. Same thing with joint replacements. If you replace a joint, 
th what they do is they st strip away the joint capsule called the synovium. And synoviums thicken in response to health issues. And I can always tell if someone's synovium is thickened. I can see it on ultrasound, but I can also feel it with my needle. Mm -hmm. As I approach it, they, I just know. Um, and my needle will tell me. When you s replace a joint and you strip away the synovium, you temporarily get a lot of pain relief, but that synovium will grow back mm -hmm. over that artificial joint. And that's why you, sometimes you'll hear, and often you'll hear about people who've had joint replacements and now they're back in pain. Yeah. The underlying issue was not addressed, which is the person probably has chronic inflammation mm -hmm. and hormonal issues. Mm -hmm. Things like being hypothyroid will cause your synovium to thicken. Mm -hmm. Things like your estrogen and testosterone and progesterone being out of balance will cause your synovium to mm -hmm. thicken. So, and if you read the literature, synovial thickening is kind of the beginning of the shit storm. Like when you, pr when a patient presents with synovial thickening or synovitis, it pretty much means like, I tell patients, I'm like, it's not going to get better after this. Oh. Things are going to progress and more joints are going to get involved. And this is really going to suck for you over the next de few decades. Mm -hmm. So we need to pull back. This isn't about giving you an injection. I mean, we can buy you some time with the injection, but this is about, we got to implement an H care. Right now. Yeah. Which like, is amazing. Like yesterday. <laughs> like yesterday. But it, it, isn't it amazing to know that I, now the uh, listeners and the viewers have an idea that there is stuff that we can do instead of saying, hey, look, my dad is supposed to get a hip replacement soon. Well, you just said that it can get worse at, at some point later in the future and yeah. to really address the underlying issues as to why. Um, like you said, blood sugar, hormones, thyroid. Um, another huge one is IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, mm -hmm. and celiac. Mm -hmm. Huge. Like, I'll share my personal story. I was super lean, super strong in my late 30s, early 40s. I was probably at, like, the peak of my health mm -hmm. ever. And I'd always been a really sick kid. So I had, like, done the rebuild. I'd rebuilt myself. And I, all of a sudden, I did, I was I just kept trying to PR my deadlifts. It was stupid. I mean, mm. that's a pathology in itself, right? Yeah. You start chasing weight because yeah. you're like, I don't want to deal with the stress in my life. I'm just going to lift more weights. And I was PRing my deadlift too often, and I tore the labrum in my hip, and my hip just down it went. And I was probably a year and a half in of chronic pain in my hip before I would even admit it because I knew even if I received, even knowing what I know, the injections I supply people you have to take time off. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to take any time off. Mm -hmm. My life was too stressful. And that was like my antidepressant. And so I wouldn't stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so finally, when I finally did go to treat my hip, I was in such an inflamed state that I ended up giving myself frozen hip. You've heard of frozen yeah. shoulder? Yeah. Who does frozen shoulder happen to? Do you remember? Uh, no, I don't. Middle-aged women. Oh, okay. Frozen shoulder. Why is it? It's a hormonal issue. Ah, it's a well, blood sugar and hormonal yeah. issue every single time. Yes, there's a biomechanical trauma. Like I said, there's a trigger, mm -hmm. but it's always a hormonal middle-aged woman thing. So I gave myself frozen hip with PRP because PRP is really inflammatory. You can actually make things worse with some of these big guns like stem cells and PRP if yeah. the patient's not in a good place overall. Gave myself frozen hip. I had to unwind that with dextrose prolotherapy, sugar water. It's a whole long story. Finally got that hip dialed in, realized my thyroid had been tanking out because the formulation I was on had changed mm. and I was no longer getting, the piggies I was getting my desiccated thyroid from was coming from a different country. Mm. Um, got that figured out, got my hip taken care of, still hadn't put two and two together the whole time I'm eating gluten, mm. which I had been off of gluten for a decade. I don't know why I was back on it, but there I was eating gluten, kind of messing around, maybe drinking too often, like just not taking really great care yeah. of myself, not meditating, not mitigating my stress. And then just when this hip got handled and I finally got it dialed in, my other hip started. Mm. And then what did I say about bilateral? Mm -hmm. The then minute really something's bilateral, yeah. I was like, oh man. And I finally figured it out. I removed gluten from my diet and optimized my testosterone and like, yeah. Everything was fixed. And I'm so mad at myself that I, I did this to myself in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. But you also helped heal it and reverse <laughs> it too, right? Like just, and now you're able to help other people in these similar situations. But True. You, you bring up a really good point. It's like, yeah, the food can be just driving it, especially if it's, you don't have to be diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease. No. But you, you literally can be reacting to food over and over and over and it can drive these things. Yep. I, I, I love that you're bringing up, like you're making joints cool and sexy here. <laughs> Because, like, I've never been so into joints in my life. <laughs> I know. Most of the time you learn it and you forget it. You're like, orthopedic class. For sure. Class, yeah. Next. But that's how it's taught everywhere. But, like, one in five patients will present to any doctor's office with joint pain. So it's a, it's a, 
it's the lightning rod. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a lightning it's rod. The, it's, it, it starts 20 years before the patient presents to our office with the diabetes. Yeah. Like they'll start complaining about chronic SI pain. If, if a young woman starts complaining about chronic sacroiliac pain, she probably is dealing with some kind of inflammatory bowel disease somewhere down the line. Mm-hmm. She's probably dealing with some kind of celiac or gluten intolerance. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be full-blown celiac, but like these are just Behringer's ah, of bad interesting. news. The, the joints tell The joint you. canaries. <laughs> they That's are. what we'll call them. Wow. <laughs> the importance of joints. So pay attention, uh, viewers, listeners, to your joints. It's so important. Yeah. You mentioned uh, also PRP. Yeah. And um, I know a lot of people want to know what uh, uh, the therapy is. So maybe we could just touch on that. Sure. I love PRP. Okay. I'll inject PRP anywhere. I was doing PRP into places that they now have names for that I was just... Anywhere I, a patient would let me. Yeah. So platelet-rich plasma is the patient's own blood. You draw their blood. You uh, you know, concentrate out their platelets. Platelets have 20-some known growth factors. They all do different things. And it. I will just preface this. This is only as good as the patient's blood. Mm. You take a hot mess of a patient that's super inflamed, and you spin down and concentrate their hot mess of blood, and you shoot it into their hot mess of an inflamed <laughs> joint. Yeah. And it does not go And well. it's going to be a hot mess. And most doctors do not consider this. And I have been like preaching this from the mountain, getting mm. from my own profession, getting slack over the years. And I'm like, I don't care what you guys say. Mm. And now it's actually getting talked about. But the, where the cells come from matters. So you really have to have an optimized patient with good PRP. When I froze my hip up, I had just come from a conference where I hadn't been sleeping. I'd been eating gluten and I'd been drinking whiskey every night mm-hmm. with the boys. It was mm-hmm. an orthopedic conference. It's all guys. And lo and behold, my hip went... Because my PRP was so inflammatory. Uh, yeah. 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 It was very pro-inflammatory. So that matters. Um, but it's it's like prolotherapy on crack. It's supercharged. Mm-hmm. And so we use it in regions where we really want a huge impact. I always prefer to do prolotherapy first because I want to prime and calm the joint. Like I said, it calms neurogenic inflammation, the dextrose, the sugar water. Mm-hmm. It gets the stem cells in the region riled up and it primes it. So when I come back with something bigger and sexier, like PRP or stem cells, which is also a lot more expensive, not only will it be less painful, but it will be a lot more potent. Sure. And I've calmed the region down. In orthopedics, in musculoskeletal medicine, we want to centralize the pain, meaning a patient comes in and like all of this hurts. Yeah. We want to get it down to a much more regulated region, and then I can come back in with my platelet-rich plasma and be more potent and okay. specific. So it, it would be better to do it then stepwise, right? Yes. Getting the prolo and then doing the PRP rather than just going straight to do. Because there's people who've asked me about PRP, and I'm like, um, yeah, I mean, like, you have to talk to your doctor about what works best, but... I think that's a good idea in the way you put it is calming it down, like stop the fire first right. and then start rebuilding and, you right. know, because that's the, what platelets do, right? The pro, the prolo might work. The sugar water might, it might work. might work in itself. And it might take away, because we don't know. I know generally looking at a patient, but their pain might be coming from neurogenic inflammation. Mm-hmm. The joint just might be angry mm-hmm. and the dextrous might do the job yeah. and that's it. But other times we need something bigger. Like if you have a labral tear or if you, you have a really bad injury or you have really bad arthritis, you might need something bigger. And then that grows up and then we have stem cells, yep. which are the only time you're getting stem cells for real. If you go to the doctor and get for everyone listening, the only time they're really stem cells is if they actually pulled your fat or your bone marrow out of your body first. Mm. If they did not extract your own fluids, you're not getting stem cells. If they if they pulled it out of a vial that was cryofrozen, you're getting growth factors. Okay. The process of taking umbilical tissue or amniotic tissue or all the other things that they're putting into vials these days and calling stem cells, um, they have to be purified and cryofrozen, and the FDA would never allow live cells in a vial. I mean, come on. That's mm-hmm. like the, the, when people say, oh, yeah, I got stem cells. I'm like, you got a vial of something. It reminds me of those little turtles that they put in the keychains in China. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, like, yeah, 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 come yeah, on, yeah, live yeah, things yeah. don't live for very long in yeah, a bottle. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So they're not stem cells. And I'm sorry I'm for anyone who yeah. has received that, who thought they were getting stem cells, you were lied to. Mm. The doctors don't know. The reps selling the vials don't often know. It's oh, a, so it's company top down then, you're it's saying? It's crazy. Oh, okay. So this it, has got to be something that we look out for. It's crazy. Yes. And stem uh, cells are expensive. They are. And what's happening is if you go, if you get invited to a hotel lecture, like free dinner at a hotel, and they bring you in and someone's in a white coat who doesn't have any credentials talking about stem cells, if they're not talking about actually harvesting your fat or your, your bone marrow, you're not getting stem cells. I you're see. getting sold a really expensive 
vial of which doesn't cost. I mean, it is expensive, but man, it's not as expensive as they mark it up. I see. It's a racket, and it's happening all over the place. Oh, interesting. It's okay. like turning into Starbucks. Wow, wow. Yeah. So then, what what would you say about exosomes? The, the, I that, love exosomes. That, yeah. <laughs> so are are they stem cells or are they? No. Those how, are, how do you amazing. describe them? God, exosomes are amazing. Um, so stem cells secrete little molecular packets of information. And when exosomes finally came on the market, I was like, I've been waiting for this for so long because I used to do adipose derived therapies in my mm -hmm. clinic and it was gross. You have to repeatedly stab somebody with a cannula mm -hmm. and pull their fat out mm -hmm. and it's messy. Um, if their fat's inflamed, which a lot of people's fat is inflamed, it would just, again, make a bigger mess out of the joint. So that wasn't fun. Bone marrow, we can't do legally in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And um, exosomes are the molecular packets that stem cells secrete as the information. They tell the cells what to change into. They tell wherever they're sent, they tell the body to do the thing. It's not the stem cell that does the magic. It's the exosomes inside the stem cell. Mm -hmm. So exosomes are stem cell derived exosomes. They're little they have no DNA. They're little molecular packets of goodness. Um, we can buy those in a vial. Mm -hmm. They're placental derived. And there are some companies doing cadaver derived and using old, old exosomes, basically. If it's coming from the blood or from bone marrow, it's old because that's not super young tissue, right? Um, so they use placent the company I use uses placental derived. And we can mix that with platelet-rich plasma and inject that in. And it's akin to doing a stem cell therapy, in I my see. opinion, just okay. from what I've seen clinically. I, I don't have any studies to compare and contrast. I just from, I have done all tens of thousands of procedures mm -hmm. and I can tell you that they work pretty darn well. That's great. And we can do them intravenously. They cross the blood brain barrier. So I have helped people who've had traumatic brain injury. I've helped, um, gosh, I can't, I'm, I, I just pulled a Crohn's patient out of a terrible Crohn's flare. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was dying and it was, this was a family member. I don't offer the IVs to my patients. Yeah. I just offer it to like people I'm close to, yeah. but because, you know, we don't know and it, they are pro grow. So meaning do they, would they help a cancer tumor grow? I don't know. That's what I was, my next question was, I don't know. do we have to worry about things like that? We I don't, don't know. know. I don't know for, for the people I've used it with. Um, it was like, Mm -hmm. You know, I helped a young person who had accidentally overdosed on street drive fentanyl and benzos and like had the brain was not functioning so well. Right. So it was like, well, what is that going to lead to? Is sure. that going to lead to like a glioblastoma later on mm -hmm. because of all the chronic mm -hmm. brain, brain inflammation mm -hmm. and like glial cell activation? Or you do this. And, yeah. Or we do this and it's like six and one half dozen of the other, you know, and so and who knows? I mean, we don't have any long term studies on stem cells, even the way sure. they're being used. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow, interesting, interesting, interesting <laughs> stuff for sure. I, I love talking about all of this. So, all right, you talked a lot about chronic pain. Let's say someone um, was, I don't know, running on the track and then they, they really hurt themselves. They're like, oh man, my knee just, I dinged my knee and now I'm, I'm limping, I can't yeah. put weight on it. Is there something that you, do you recommend people not doing something immediately or doing something immediately? How do we treat this yeah. before we go out and see a doctor? Like what are the steps we can take? Cause that's really actionable stuff. Yeah. So that's a great, uh, great question. So what do most people do when they hurt themselves? Ice it. Yeah. And take NSAIDs, right? NSAIDs. Yeah. So the, this is a little science here. Um, the inflammatory cascade is the first part of the wound healing cascade. And so each part of the wound healing cascade ultimately leads to collagen deposition. It takes about 300 days for really good collagen to synthesize, lay itself down. Collagen is supposed to lay down linearly. Tendons and ligaments are linear patterns of collagen bundles. Um, when collagen first lays down, it lays down all haphazardly like a mishmash. And through, this is another reason I love strength training, through training and movement that's strategic, it will line itself up along lines of tension. So we have to put those lines of tension on there for your collagen to actually become strong and stable. When you, each part of the wound healing cascade is dependent on the last to go to fruition. So the first portion, the first 10 to 14 days, which is the inflammatory cascade is the most critical. If we cut that off and we shut it down, none of this happens and you shoot yourself in the foot. With the NSAIDs. Yes. Okay. So if you ice it and you put NSAIDs in your body, you literally shut down the first part of that wound healing cascade, the most critical part. So I actually tell people to move it, heat it and suck it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just get through it. Sometimes we use a little bit of ibuprofen. I prefer to use natural nutraceuticals like curcumin, mm -hmm. fish oil, things that do have some, these are all cox, NSAIDs are cox two inhibitors and not to get too bio, you know, biochemical, but cox two inhibition is where you shut off that inflammatory cascade. 
We don't want full COX-2 inhibition. Mm -hmm. So taking herbs that have, like white willow bark, they have some COX inhibition, but not enough to like ruin the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I use nutraceuticals and maybe a little bit of ibuprofen, maybe a few minutes of ice, just a little bit, just to give people a little bit of pain relief when it's, I know that it can be excruciating when you hurt yourself, but what we want is movement. And if you talk to people who have been athletes their whole life, they'll tell you like, Guys who squat and deadlift, if they hurt themselves squatting and deadlift, the first deadlifting, the first thing they'll do is go squat and deadlift. Mm. Like you go back and do the thing I that see. caused the the discomfort. We don't go home and take a ton of ibuprofen. Yeah. Right? So it's really important to make sure that you keep moving through it. I love chiropractics because I feel like that gets things, you know, gets things put back where they should be. But whatever manual therapies that you enjoy, acupuncture is wonderful. You know, if you need to have an intervention, do something that's that's just easy. It's, it's not a huge intervention. It's not going to shut down any inflammatory cascades. It's complementary to healing. And then if that doesn't work and they're say six to eight weeks out and they're still really hurting, that might be the time to talk to somebody about prolotherapy. But even then I would give your body a chance, eat well, sleep well, move well. And generally speaking, most people heal up, right? Yeah. yeah so we're but amazing. If, it, if it doesn't, yeah. And the body's amazing, but if it doesn't after a few months, I think that's where finding a good prolotherapist is. So really handy. quick, the, the, what so the consequence of that haphazard deposition of collagen and it not and not depositing up. line lined up what happens then if you if you stop that cascade or from happening you are way more prone to re-injury re-injury okay and then also something just to note is that so nerves so what when you hurt yourself um, your body tries to lay down a wall of blood vessels to get nutrients in right mm -hmm. and to move metabolites out and so you get angiogenesis you get and same with cancer right you get you mm -hmm. get little blood vessels moving in to try to heal up the region well with blood vessels comes nerves mm -hmm. and what happens with joints when they are injured most joints have a network of proprioceptive nerves and what proprioceptive nerves are just nerves that tell your joint where they are in space. Mm -hmm. And so your knee knows where it is in space. So like if you go to step and kind of twist, and it's like, whoa, don't go further, you're gonna pop it. Those are your proprioceptors. We have them everywhere. We have them really densely oriented in our upper cervicals. Mm -hmm. We have them in our knees, our ankles, in our pelvis. We have them everywhere. Um, some ligaments like the ACL, for instance, in the knee that gets torn often and people get ACL replacements, the ACL might actually be more importantly a proprioceptive ligament that tells your knee where it is in mm -hmm. space. So these are really important um, nerve fibers. And when you ice things and take NSAIDs and you get haphazard collagen deposition, I really think you don't get really great regrowth of your proprioceptive nerves. So you're not only more prone to injury because the joint is no longer very stable, but you're prone to joint in further joint injury because you've just blown out all your proprioceptors. Mm -hmm. Things that really damage proprioceptors that I have found clinically are or uh, sorry, cortisone injections. Mm -hmm. Anytime anyone's had a cortisone injection, I can't even palpate the pain generators anymore. It's like everything got screwed up. The pain nerves are gone, the proprioceptive, everything's just, it's just not there. I can't recreate what I should be able to recreate with my hands. Um, radial ablation, which is a common procedure in the spine, which is actually where they radi they put radio waves in to ablate your nerves. Mm. That causes a lot of proprioceptive disruption. So things just break down a lot faster. And then we've got this crappy collagen deposition. Yeah. So it's like an, another accident waiting to happen. You mean to tell me they have a procedure that tells you, it, that destroys the signals of pain Yes. Just to put a Band-Aid so we stop the pain instead of getting to the root cause. Yes. And in the process, it destroys the proprioceptors. So when you destroy proprioception in a joint, guess what? The joint starts moving aberrantly, and now you've set yourself up for further arthritis. Which is why the t we see a lot of these athletes get an injury. They're out for six weeks, eight weeks, half the season. They come back, and then they're hurt again. The same injury. Like, you know, I think we saw it with Derek, Derek Rose on NBA. He tore his knee, and then he tore his other knee, and then he tore his other knee. And... Or the same knee, and that, that we see that it must have been a proprioception thing. Oh yeah, where it always like, is. Maybe I, I can do this, and you know. I watch it like on Sports Center. I watch the, you know, the, the banner going across mm -hmm. the top of like all the injuries, and I was like, if I could just, <laughs> I see it with musicians too. I think about like you know, think about all the musicians we've lost in the last few years, and it was all from my generation. Like Prince died, Tom Petty died, all these artists Chris died. Chris Cornell. I know. Yeah. That one makes me very that sad. That was sad. But most, if you think about the root cause, so why did Prince die? He was 
Michael Jackson, they were all taking painkillers. Tom yeah. Petty died from, they all died from overdoses, accidental overdoses. Uh, it, they were all crazy. in pain. Oh my God. They were all in pain and they, and most of them had hip pain, which having just gone through it, the crazy, here's, this is super interesting and I don't mean to nerd out, but the head of your femur has pain nerves and it has proprioceptive nerves in the cartilage. And when the joint starts becoming pathologic and degenerating, the proprioceptive nerves move out of the way and the pain nerves start to centralize wherever mm -hmm. there's forces of pressure. So now a painful hip just became a lot more painful yeah. and a lot more unstable. Yeah. So it doesn't know where it is in space and now it hurts really, really bad. And having lived through it, it feels like you're walking around on the tip of a broomstick. Oh, feel, I mean, it's horrible. And that's one of the things I think dextrose, and I don't have any studies to prove this, but what I've seen clinically is like that dextrose helps dissipate that and slow that down so that the patient can actually feel their hip. Yeah. They're, and then when you have joint issues inside a joint, we call it internal joint derangement, all the muscles around that region will neurologically shut down. Mm. So now it'll start to move really aberrantly. So when people squat, they'll like, ah, yeah. or they go to move their shoulder and all the muscles. And so they'll get a bunch of PT to try to make the muscles move more efficiently together. But if the labrum's torn or the cartilage is disintegrating, it neurologically will shut down to protect itself. Yep. So it just begets more arthritis, right? Mm. So I really think like the one-two punch of like treat it with the regenerative injections, then go get the PT. That's a really potent recipe for success. You need both. Oh, unbelievable. That's, this is great information. <laughs> this is, we haven't had a podcast like this or a show like this. So um, thank you for coming on. Uh, before you go, how do people find you? Uh, you, you have a show yourself, right? Yes, I have. A, it's called Pain Free Strong Radio. So you can find me at painfreestrongradio.com and you need to come on there. Mm -hmm. And so I talk about all this stuff in depth and I've got, I've like had Carrie Jones and a bunch of great uh, guests on there. I talked about a lot of these issues on in separate episodes that I did myself and then I have a book by the same title that you can find at drtina.com and you can find me on Instagram at drtina mm -hmm. so every so you, there's no excuse we can find <laughs> you everywhere you give us all the information we, we the ever info. needed <laughs> And then you're working in Portland. If anyone in the area wants to see you or come out to see you, you're still taking patients or? No, I closed my practice. Oh, you close it. I now did. you're just teaching people how to, and other doctors. Yeah, how I to train do what other you doctors do. how to do this. I Amazing. closed my practice about a year ago. I, I kept a few patients to keep my skills sharp. But Yeah, but you have a great network. So either yeah. way, if you, if you you can give recommendations to people all across the country, I yeah, know you, you I do have that. A great, uh, I have a great cheat sheet for them where they can Beautiful. get their, their questions answered. So. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on, yeah, thank spreading you. this knowledge. This is amazing <laughs> stuff. And I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you too. All right. All right, Tina, what an amazing conversation. I told you, listen, every single person I bring on this show is going to add value to your life. That is the, that's the screening criteria. And Tina added so much beautiful value to our life. Look, now we understand better about our body, better about our joints, better about our muscles. This is a theme that's going on in a lot of these podcasts. So get out there, start working working out and taking care of yourself. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for supporting the show. I love you all. I can't wait to do this next week. I can't wait to bring some good, fire, hot information. I love you all. Thank you, have a great week.